Hello, I'm Dr. Maurice Dupre, and in this section we're going to discuss calculating limits using the limit laws. Our basic objective here is to see how when we look at a limit problem involving a complex algebraic expression, we can use limit rules to break it down into simple pieces. The main theorem that allows us to break complex limit problems into simple ones is theorem one, the limit laws. If L, M, C, and K are real numbers, and the limit as X approaches C of F of X equals capital L, and the limit as X approaches C of G of X equals capital M, then first the sum rule. The limit as x approaches c of the quantity f of x plus g of x is equal to l plus m. That means that if I have a sum of terms and I want to compute the limit of that sum of terms, I can break it up and do it term-wise. The difference rule says that the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus g of x would be l minus m. In other words, if I have a sum of terms with minus signs, I just again break it up and do each of the terms. The limit of the difference of two functions is the difference of their limits. The limit of the sum of the two functions is the sum of their limits. So in effect, we just compute limits term-wise. Next, we have the product rule. The limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x is l times m. That is, it's the product of the individual limits. That means in each term, we can break the limit problem into looking at the limits of each of the factors. The limit of a product of, a, of two functions is the product of their limits. Now, let's take a special case of this. For instance, suppose g of x is the constant little k. Well, in that case, the limit as x approaches c of g of x will be little k. That is, capital M here would be little k. And this rule would say the limit as x approaches c of f of x times k equals L times k. Can you keep that in your head? Well, let's look at it. In other words, that's called the constant multiple rule. And what that says is the limit as x approaches c of a constant times f of x is simply a constant times the limit L of f of x. Now, for the quotient rule, when we see quotients, the limit as x approaches c of f of x over g of x is the quotient of the limits provided the limit of the denominator, capital M, is not equal to zero. That's a very important provision. And in fact, this provision is what makes many limits that we'll have to compute into interesting problems. Finally, we have the power rule. If R and S are integers with no common factor and S is not equal to zero, then the limit as X approaches C of F of X raised to the power R over S is simply capital L to the R over S. That is, provided L to the R over S is a real number. That is, notice if S is even, this is an even root, we'd be having to assume that L is positive. If the L is negative, but S were an odd root. In that case, we can take odd roots of negative numbers. In any case, what this is saying is the limit of a rational power of a function is that power of the limit of the function, provided the latter is a real number. That is, it makes sense. The bottom line here is that in a complicated algebraic expression, to take the limit we just take the limit of all the little pieces, and provided the end result makes sense, it works. The problem comes when sometimes you put in the limits of the pieces and something doesn't make sense, like you have a zero in a denominator, or you have an even root of a negative number. In that case, your rules have broken down, and you have to try to make some kind of algebraic manipulation to cancel something out, or go to a completely different route to find the limit, or possibly the limit doesn't exist. Well, now let's work a problem and see how these limit laws work for us. Here we have the limit as y approaches negative 5 of y squared divided by 5 minus y. 
So when I look at this expression, I see right off what I'm dealing with is a quotient of two expressions. And so consequently, I want to think of the quotient rule. It says I can take the limit of the quotients as the quotient of the limits. So we'll say the limit as y approaches negative 5 of y squared all divided by the limit as y approaches negative 5 of 5 minus y. Now, the limit, the quotient rule says that this is true provided the limit of the numerator exists, the limit of the denominator exists, and the denominator limit is not zero. So what about this denominator limit? Well, our difference rule tells us that the limit of this expression, 5 minus y, is the difference of the limits. Well, the limit of 5 is obviously 5, and the limit as y approaches negative 5 of negative y, what is that? The limit as y approaches negative 5 of negative y would be simply the negative of the limit as y approaches negative 5 of y. And of course, the limit as y approaches any specific number of y itself is just that specific number. So we have negative the quantity negative 5, which is, of course, 5. I'm belaboring every little point here on how these limit rules apply in order to emphasize that they are doing all the work here. So consequently, what would be the limit as 5 minus y by the difference rule? 5 minus negative 5, that's 5 plus 5, or 10. In other words, our denominator limit is not 0, it's 10. Likewise, for our numerator, we have, in effect, a product or a power. We can apply either the product rule, this is negative 5 times negative 5, or we could apply the power rule, it's an even power, negative 5 squared is again negative 5 times negative 5. Either way, we see now we have negative 5 squared divided by 5 plus 5. Well, negative 5 squared, of course, is 25. 5 plus 5 is 10. And so we end up with 25 tenths, which, of course, we could cancel 5. But the point here is that our limit rules have allowed us, in effect, in the end, to get what would be the result of just coming over here to the original expression, and everywhere I see a y, I simply replace it by negative 5. So let's just come right back here and try that and see what we would get. Everywhere I see a y, I replace it with negative 5. I get negative 5 squared divided by 5 minus negative 5. And then we see that is exactly 25 tenths, which canceling 5, of course, is 5 halves. But see how simple it is, and that's because of our limit theorems telling us our limit laws. And finally, of course, keep in mind, if this had not made sense, then that would have told us that one of our limit laws didn't apply. In this case, what could have gone wrong? Well, we could have ended up with a zero in the denominator, and that would tell us that the quotient rule could not be applied. Then we'd have to go back and try another route to the limit. But basically, when you're working a limit, the limit laws tell you, in effect, the first thing to try is just take that limiting value, substitute it for the variable everywhere, see if that works. If it does, in an algebraic expression, that will give the limit correctly. All right, now let's look at a problem where we use the limit laws to calculate a limit. And in this case, we'll see how we can deal with radicals using the power rule. OK, so here in this problem, we have the limit as h approaches 0 of 3 divided by the quantity square root of 3h plus 1 plus 1. So here we have an expression inside a radical. How can we deal with that? Well, remember the radical, in this case the square root, is the 1 half power. So in effect, I can rewrite this as the limit 
as h approaches zero of three divided by three h plus one to the one half power plus one. And so now I can start applying my limit laws in effect to really belabor every point here. We would say, okay, it's the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. And of course, the numerator being just the constant three that the numerator limit is three. And down here we have the limit as h approaches zero of the quantity 3h plus 1 to the 1 half power plus 1. And now our sum rule tells us that the limit of the denominator is in effect the sum of the limits of these two terms. Well, of course, the limit of 1 is 1. And so we end up with 3 divided by the limit as h approaches 0 of 3h plus 1 to the 1 half power, all that, plus 1. Now remember, in effect, I've applied the quotient rule here in my first step. Keep that in mind. So if we were to end up with 0 in the denominator as a result of all this calculation, then we have to keep in mind that our first step was invalid. But in any case, we're proceeding. And so what does our power rule tell us to compute the limit as h approaches 0 of some quantity to the 1 half power? It would be simply the limit of what's inside raised to the 1 half power. That is, we now have limit as h approaches 0 of 3h plus 1, all raised to the 1 half power plus 1 in our denominator. So now we can easily finish this one off. Our sum rule tells us the limit as h approaches 0 of 3h plus 1 is simply 1 plus the limit as h approaches 0 of 3h. Now, of course, the limit as h approaches 0 of 3h is 3 times the limit as h approaches 0 of h. In other words, obviously, that is going to go to 0, and we just have 1 to the 1 half power, which is 1. So we end up here with 1 to the 1 half plus 1, which is simply 3 halves. Now, we didn't get a 0 in the denominator, and consequently that means that our denominator limit is perfectly good back here where we applied our first step, that the limit as h approaches 0 of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. That was valid, and so our whole answer, 3 halves here in the end, is the limit of what we started with. Now notice, in terms of existence of limits, our limit theorem not only tells us that these limit rules give us the combinations, it also tells us the existence of the limit that is, the question as to the existence of this limit is now boiled down to the question of the existence of this limit, which boiled down to does the limit as h approaches 0 of h exist? Well, of course, that limit exists and is 0. So the limit laws here are giving us the limits and telling us they exist in this situation. Well, what we've seen in our first two examples is that when we're using the limit laws to calculate limits, the existence and the value of the limit are provided if we can take that limiting value and substitute it in for the variable in the expression. No matter how complicated the algebraic expression is, as long as it's just involving sums and differences, quotients, products, constants, fractional powers, possibly, which are rational, reduced to lowest terms, radicals, and so forth. If that's all it is, you just replace the variable with that limiting value. And if everything makes sense, the limit laws are telling you that value that results is the value of the limit, and the limit exists. But sometimes when we do that, there will be problems. That is, you can get a zero in the denominator or a negative in a radical expression. Something is not going to make sense. In that case, 
we have to do otherwise. We have to do some algebraic manipulation on the expression. Let's look at an example. Here in this example, we want to take the limit as h approaches 0 of the square root of the quantity 3h plus 1 minus 1 all divided by h. Now the first thing you notice is that if I try to apply the quotient rule in the denominator, I'll have the limit as h approaches 0 of h, which is 0. So I'll obviously have a situation where the quotient rule cannot apply. So in this situation, we look at the numerator, what's happening there. Remember, the general result of the limit laws is, is that, in effect, you replace the variable with the limiting value. And if it makes sense, then that is the limit. So what's the limit of the numerator? Replace the h by 0, and we just have square root 1 minus 1. So this is a limit of where the numerator is 0 in limiting value, and the denominator in limiting value is 0. It's 0 over 0, in effect. We call limits of this form limits of the form 0 over 0. So in this situation, where you see a radical minus something or a difference of two radicals, the trick here, which is very often the thing that will solve the problem, is to multiply top and bottom by the sum of the exact same two terms. In this case, replace that negative sign with a plus sign. We have the square root of 3h plus 1 plus 1. And so in order to make up for having simply multiplied by that expression in the numerator, I divide by it as well. In effect, I'm multiplying by something that is equal to 1. Now notice what's going to happen. In the numerator, I can multiply these two terms, and what's going to happen? This times this is 3h plus 1. In other words, the first term times first term gives me 3h plus 1. Then we have our cross terms. Well, the first cross term is the first radical times the last. That's plus the radical, and then minus the radical. They cancel out. And then finally, negative 1 times plus 1 is negative 1. So our entire numerator has collapsed to simply 3h plus 1 minus 1. Quite a simplification. And our denominator is h times that expression that we multiplied by in the denominator, square root 3h plus 1 plus 1. And of course, now this is the expression we're calculating the limit of, and so we want to take the limit as h approaches 0 of this expression. Well, first off, we see right away the plus 1 and the minus 1s cancel out. When I do that, notice this numerator is just simplified to 3h. Now, as a second cancellation, I can cancel the h's, and I'm going to denote that by two crosses through the h like that. And so our numerator is now a 3, and there is no h in the denominator in this factor here all by itself. The only place the h appears is inside the radical. So now let's try again. Let's see what we've simplified this to. We have the limit as h approaches 0 of simply the 3 divided by square root of 3h plus 1 plus 1. And so now we say, let's try again. Put the h equals 0 in the expression and see if it works now. Well, if I put h equals 0 here, the radical just the square root of 1, which is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. And we do not get 0 anymore. So that means we can say our final limit is 3 divided by the square root of 3 times 0 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3 over square root 1 plus 1, or simply 3 halves. In other words, we can do algebraic 
simplifications and rearrangements on our expression and often get the limit rules to apply where they don't apply to the original expression that's presented to us. Now let's look at another problem where we're dealing with a limit effectively of the form 0 over 0. In this case, the crucial technique is going to be factoring. Now you remember that factoring can sometimes be tricky, but I'm going to show you here that in the problems we have to deal with in limits, the factoring problem is really never tricky. Okay, here in this problem, we want to compute the limit as t approaches 1 of the quantity t squared plus t minus 2 divided by the quantity t squared minus 1. So as our first attempt, then, we would just apply the limit laws and say, well, let's replace t everywhere by 1 and hope for the best. Well, 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2 minus 2 is 0, so we get 0 in the numerator. And 1 squared is 1 minus 1. We get 0 in the denominator. So again, what we've got is a limit of the form 0 over 0. The quotient rule cannot be validly applied. However, one thing to remember, whenever you see polynomial expressions, if you put a number into a polynomial and it gives 0, then that tells you how to factor the polynomial. In particular, putting t equal to 1 in the numerator and getting 0 is telling me that t minus 1 is a factor. We're going to solve this problem by factoring the numerator and the denominator in effect, but factoring isn't difficult here. Why? Because I know what the factor is. What's the other factor? Well, notice whatever the other factor is, it's got a, we're going to have t minus something, and that something times negative 1 is negative 2, so that would have to be t plus 2. You see, in other words, look at that. t times t is the t squared. Negative 1 times plus 2 is the negative 2. We knew one of the factors was t minus 1, so that's the only thing it can be. Does it work? Check it. What's the cross term? Negative 1 times t is a negative t plus 2t. 2t minus t is plus t. You see, the factoring problem is not really a problem here because we're guaranteed what one of the factors is. Let's look at the denominator. Of course, we recognize how to factor that. We all know that's t minus 1 times t plus 1 will be t squared minus 1. But we know that when I put t equal to 1 and get 0, we know right off t minus 1 is a factor. So we just put a t here because, remember, our leading coefficient here is 1. So factor the t squared. It's t times t. What's the other factor? Well, it has to be a number which multiplied by negative 1 gives negative 1. Well, that means 1. So we have here the limit as t approaches 1 of the quantity t minus 1 times t plus 2 divided by t minus 1 times t plus 1. Now we can cancel those common factors. And notice what's happened now. The culprit, which is causing the zero in the denominator, is gone. So now, in effect, we have just the limit as t approaches 1 of t plus 2 divided by t plus 1. And so let's try again. All we have to do is replace t everywhere by 1. 1 plus 2 divided by 1 plus 1 is 3 halves. And so consequently, our limit laws apply, but only after we do an algebraic rearrangement, which allows us to cancel out the problem that's causing the zero in the denominator. So remember, whenever you're dealing with a quotient of two polynomials, if it's of the form zero over zero, that's telling you that that variable minus the limit number, in this case it was a 1, the t minus 1 has to be a factor of the numerator, has to be a factor of the denominator. In the case of second degree polynomials, then you can instantly factor. If it were higher degree, 
For instance, if I had a t cubed plus t minus 2, or which would still have given me a 0, I would take the t minus 1, and using long division of polynomials, I would simply divide it in to the numerator polynomial to find the other factor. Likewise for the denominator. In other words, this becomes a straightforward process. All right, now let's look at another problem where we have a limit of the form 0 over 0, and our numerator and denominator are both polynomials again. This time we'll have to deal with higher degrees, though. Okay, so here I have the limit as x approaches negative 2 of negative 2x minus 4 divided by the quantity x cubed plus twice the quantity x squared. Well, Again, if we try to use the limit laws in the simplest form, we would just substitute negative 2 for x everywhere. But if I do that, I've got a 0 in the denominator. Notice negative 2 cubed is negative 8, whereas negative 2 squared is 4 times 2 is now a plus 8. We'd have negative 8 plus 8 is 0 in the denominator. Well, what about for the numerator? Negative 2 times negative 2 is plus 4, minus 4 is 0. So again, we have a limit of the form 0 over 0. Of course, that tells us that x minus the negative 2, which in this case means simply x plus 2, must be a factor of each of these polynomials. Well, in this case, the factorization of the denominator is actually easy because notice we've got x cubed, x squared. We see instantly x squared is a common factor, so we pull that out. We have x squared times the quantity x plus 2. And in the numerator, let's factor out our negative 2. We have negative 2 times the quantity x plus 2. And so that's what we want to take the limit of as x approaches negative 2. So far, all I've done is an algebraic rearrangement. But next, what I'm going to do is cancel the x plus 2s, the common factors. And so finally, then, by algebraic rearrangement, we've simplified our limit to just being the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the quantity negative 2 this is over x squared. So at this point, try again. Replace the x by negative 2. We get negative 2 over negative 2 squared, which is negative 2 over 4, or finally just negative a half as our limit. So what happened here? We had a limit of the form 0 over 0. We're taking the limit as x approaches negative 2. So x minus negative 2, which is x plus 2, has to be a factor of the numerator polynomial, has to be a factor of the denominator polynomial. In this case, we had a third degree polynomial in the denominator. So uh, the factorization could be a bit difficult, but in this case, fortunately, it was easy. We just factor out an x square. However, if this denominator polynomial had been longer and there wasn't a simple common factor to pull out, I would have taken x plus 2 using long division of polynomials divided into that polynomial, and that would give me the other factor. In other words, that's just a straightforward procedure. OK, let's look at another problem where we have to deal with the limit of the form 0 over 0. In this case, we're going to be dealing with the radical expression. So here we have the limit as x approaches 1 of the quantity x minus 1 divided by the quantity square root of x plus 3 minus 2. Now, if I replace the x everywhere by 1, the numerator is 1 minus 1, which is 0. 
And down here in the denominator, 1 plus 3 is 4, square root 4 is 2, and 2 minus 2 is 0. So again, we have a limit of the form 0 over 0. And here we see this difference of a radical and a number, which we could in other situations have a difference of two radicals. But do you remember how to deal with that? Why don't you try this one on your own and then see how I work it? Okay, so here we have this problem. We've got 0 over 0 and a difference of a radical with a number. And the way we deal with that is we multiply by top and bottom. The expression we get by replacing this negative sign with a plus sign. In other words, copy the thing down, the two terms but replace the negative sign by a plus sign and put it in both the numerator and denominator. So in effect, what we have here is just a big complicated expression for the number one. Well, when I multiply the difference of the two terms by the sum of the same two terms, notice what happens. Radical times radical, that's just going to be x plus 3. The negative 2 times the plus 2 is negative 4. And what about the cross term? Negative 2 times the radical, plus 2 times the radical, they cancel out. So the radical is completely gone, and our denominator is simplified down to x plus 3 minus 4. What about the new numerator? Well, that's simply x minus 1 quantity times the quantity radical, x plus 3 plus 2, all of that. So that looks still a little complicated, and we have to take the limit as x approaches 1. But notice what happens when we simplify the denominator. x plus 3 minus 4, well, that's simply x minus 1. So we have the limit as x approaches 1 of the quantity x minus 1 times radical x plus 3 plus 2, all divided by x minus 1. And so at this point, we see the x minus 1s cancel. And so our final problem has reduced to limit as x approaches 1 of radical x plus 3 plus 2. At this point now, the limit rule tells us that's a power, 1 half power, sum of terms, Limit of constants of constant again, just replace the x by 1. Nothing can go wrong now. We have square root of 1 plus 3 plus 2, which is square root 4 plus 2, 2 plus 2, that's 4. And so there's the final answer, the number 4. Again, remember this trick. When you see a radical minus a number causing you a problem that's producing a zero, making zero over zero. Or if you see radical minus another radical, both square root radicals, then simply multiply top and bottom by the sum of those two terms. Well, now we've seen how the limit laws apply to evaluate limits of complicated algebraic expressions. So remember, the first step that the limit laws, in effect, give us is, is that if you replace the variable by the limiting numerical value, and if everything makes sense, then that's going to be the limit. But if something goes wrong, for instance, you get a problem with a radical or zeros in denominators, then that's telling you the limit laws have broken down, and then you have to do some cancellation and algebraic rearrangement in order to get around it. Again, what you want to do then is rearrange so that the limit laws do apply. Now, remember, there are two basic things to keep in mind, which will be getting you through most of the examples. The first thing to keep in mind is that if you have a limit of the form 0 over 0, where the numerator and denominator are both polynomials, then that's telling you how to factor those polynomials to cancel the common factor that's causing the zero.
if you have radicals in the denominator, a difference of two radicals or a radical minus a number, and these are square root radicals, the way to solve the problem is to multiply top and bottom by the sum of those same two terms to get rid of the problem. Well, now that you've seen some of these examples work, you might want to try some on your own.